Welcome back to the Heal with Gold show. I am so honored today to speak to a young man who is wise beyond his years, his experience, what he's doing, what he has accomplished in 20 years is really something to admire. Um, I really, really hope that if you have a teenager, uh, a young adult member in your family, that you will share this interview with them, if not now, later. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody who's coming in. If you're not, if you didn't approve StreamYard, give me your name so I know who you who you are because otherwise it says Facebook user. Anyway, please, please share with the young adults uh, in your life because this is an interview that it will be extremely meaningful to them uh, and really will help them see their lives from a different perspective in a way that can catapult the way that they live in a wholesome loving, full and complete way. Um, I just want to share before I bring Elijah on stage, I want to share with you something very interesting because uh, Elijah has a condition called Duchenne. It's a muscular dy dystrophy. A, uh, it's a specific type of muscular dystrophy. And it's not something that everybody knows somebody with it. You know, it's, it's not super common. Uh, but I had two experiences before uh, meeting Elijah. So my first experience was that I had a babysitter and uh, she was a living babysitter when my kids were younger. And she needed a place to have her kids uh, in between where, you know, when she, she was living with me during the weekend, they were in her home with her care outside. Uh, but she needed a certain time to, to she didn't have, who would care for them. So I said to her, no problem, bring them to my house and we'll take care of all of the kids together. So her two kids came. Uh, her son was about eight years old and I started noticing that he was tripping and falling. And I said to her, you need to take him to the doctor because I think that there is something wrong with his muscles. And indeed he was diagnosed with the shame. Um, years later, I moved to Boca Raton and one of my friends, um, we have a beautiful family. We lived in the same condominium in the same area. And the same thing happened. The son, after a certain amount of time, we started noticing that he would fall. He, he would have difficulties walking. And um, as time progressed, he was diagnosed with Duchenne. Um, today, he's also a young man, very similar age to Elijah. When I was approached by Elijah's publicist, the story immediately touched my heart because I felt connected to the parents. I felt connected to their stories, uh, had a, a little bit of a level of understanding of what it means to see your, your son uh, deteriorate. Um, but Elijah's story really caught my heart because what this amazing young person did with his story was exactly what I write in my book about what a thriver does with his situation, her, his situation. And um, Elijah wrote this book. We're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about his story. We're going to talk together now about what he's doing. And I ask you, please go to my page, do a, do a watch party, make sure the people in your community are listening to the story. This is beyond the shame. This is about what do we do? It's the choice that we take of how we react to the adversities that come into our lives. Without further ado, welcome Elijah. Thank you so much for having me today. My, my pleasure. And I think you could hear what I was saying that uh, Duchesne is something that I have been a witness to it for many years. Um, so first of all, how common or uncommon is Duchenne? Tell us about it. Yeah, so Duchenne muscle dystrophy, it's a muscle wasting disease that eats away a person's muscles as time progresses. So when I was six years old, that's when I was diagnosed with the disease and we noticed that I was walking on my tippy toes, which is what is uh, one of the major signs that somebody has this disease, you know, frequent following, uh, kind of like what you, what you witnessed. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was 11 years old, I went into a power wheelchair uh, patients with this disease will lose their ability to walk. And then 
it would also attack your arms. Uh, so later in my teenage years, I started experiencing muscle weakness in my arms. And the worst part about the disease is it's fatal. The reason why it's fatal is because your heart and diaphragm are muscles as well. And those will be attacked. Most patients pass away when they're 25 years old. But I believe that we're going to do something about that. I think that we're entering the, the golden age of medicine right now. So I'm very uh, excited about that. But um, I want to touch on something that you, you brought up, which I thought was really interesting. You, know, so you said that this is bigger than Duchenne. Um, this is about overcoming adversity. And that's exactly right. You know, I think that um, my story and me having this disease is really just uh, a tool that I can use to show people to overcome adversity, whether that's having a disease or whether that's, you know, emotional problems or financial problems or some type of hardship in their life. You know, I want to be a symbol. I want to be a, a light that can show them that they can overcome that darkness, that they can overcome that challenge and adversity. So I thought that was really cool that you brought that up. First of all, thank you for saying that. And you are a light and you are already. That's what's so incredible about your story is that you want that and every day you make make it count. And you are doing exactly that. You're going on podcasts, you're writing a book, you're sharing your story. And this is the only way that we can influence other people into taking action because when they see people hurting, that they're using their pain to bring light by right? they're using their wisdom and experience that they gain from their experience to do better for others. That's when they can really see that it's possible for them because they're seeing somebody who is in the midst of adversity, who's trying to lift other people up. I mean, this brings so much hope. It brings to me, I think that doing this kind of work, uh, I mentioned briefly to you before I went, we went live that I wrote a book and I had researched and I had interviewed women thrivers for about uh, three years. And they all share their stories in, in, with the purpose to help other people. And their way of achieving this joy within adversity is all in your book. It's all in my book. And and I was telling you, you know, we're handing over people the, the Bible, the, the steps to take in order to achieve it. But the hard part is to putting all of these things in place. I, before we talk about your book and before we talk about all of these lessons that you share, I would like you to talk about your family. Um, you lost a brother for the, from, uh, to Duchesne and you have a, a younger sibling with Duchesne. I want to to hear if you can share the story from the beginning, um, how it happened with your older brother and you know, and how, how it happened for your parents, because I want to also share a little bit the perspective of your parents, you know, how they've been dealing with all of this. Sure, so my, my oldest brother, Will, he's uh, 25 um, and he, you know, he's completely healthy and everything like that. Um, and then you have me, I'm 20 years old and I have the disease, the shin muscle dystrophy. And then my younger brother, Max, uh, he had it as well, but he also had other health complications. When he was born, he had open heart surgery and didn't go too well. And it left him being confined to a bed his whole life, um, mm -hmm. blind, not able to, um, to speak, not able, he was cognitively delayed, needed a nurse full time. So he had a lot of problems in addition to having to shin, um, and he unfortunately passed away when he was 14 years old uh, to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then my youngest brother, Kai, he's 14 right now, um, and he's in a power wheelchair, and he has Duchenne muscular dystrophy too. So that would be my family um, overview. Uh, but the way it really started is when I was like five years old, they noticed that I was walking on my tippy toes. I was falling to the floor. I you know, couldn't really get upstairs too easily. But the one thing that really stood out is my mom wanted to measure my height. So she, you know, she puts me up against the wall and she says, Hey, you know, stand there and let me measure your height. Now put your heels down. I couldn't put my heels down. I'm standing on my tippy toes. And she thought I was messing around. She's like, Oh, I just stopped messing around or whatever. And I, and I wasn't messing around. And so what happened is uh, <laughs> she realized, okay, well, we need to, we need to do something. You know, the reason she's measuring my height is so I can get out of a booster seat in the car, right? Just sit there normally. And, um, I couldn't put my heels down. So that's got kind of started the whole process. Started going to doctors and the specialist did blood work. And then after that, we also did a muscle biopsy just to confirm it. And, and it came back, you know, it's the shin muscular dystrophy. And so that's the disease that I have. 
So, but she did she already know the symptoms from your from your brother who had passed, or he? What so, the, on the first he, one? What was the yeah. order? I'm trying to figure out the order. Was this a, a surprise at that point yeah. when? You, so I'm the first one with the, like the Shen Muscular Dystrophy mm -hmm. in the sense of like, I'm the one who made my family, my parents aware of it. Okay. My brother, Max, we learned that he had it um, years later after my diagnosis. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm number one in the order. And then it would actually be like my little brother, Kai and Max at the same time. Cause we realized Kai was walking on his toes and stuff like that. That seemed really similar to, to my upbringing. And so then they thought, well, cause Max never could walk. Right. Cause he was, the day he was born, they had that surgery. So he was, you know, already confined to a bed basically at that point. So we never really saw those symptoms. So we learned that Max had to shoot way later, but it helped explain a lot of the, a lot of his condition and why he didn't do too well with surgeries and stuff like that. Um, but we learned that later, you know, after, after Kai got diagnosed and Kai's the youngest in the family. Interesting. I, I, I wanted to hear a little bit from you, from your parents' perspective, because they must be, incredibly strong people to be able to, first of all, I always believe that people are what they see. I mean, right? Some people really go completely out, right? They, they, they're in a very bad place and they want to fight it. So they completely take away from where they were and they, be, and they make themselves a new person. They, are, they become something completely different. But most times people, they see their parents and they learn good traits, bad traits, and then they emulate those traits. I see you so strong, so knowledgeable, so articulate. Does Is this something that you saw in your parents? Well, I would say that my parents have a huge, huge impact on me in the sense of how they raised me. You know, one thing that I always talk about a lot is the self-image, which is a lesson in my book. And my parents, you know, they always treated me normal and expected greatness out of me. They never said, oh, well, you know, you get a pass because you're you have this disease or you're in a wheelchair. It was never that. And um, mm -hmm. I would say that that treatment of just viewing their kids as normal and not putting them in a box, not putting the wheelchair box on them is huge. So I think that they, they raised me that way. And the other thing, too, you know, talking about my dad, you know, talking about upbringing and why I'm the way I am. I was raised by a head football coach. <laughs> my dad was a football coach, and that's a huge part of my story. I think, you know, when I was five years old, I'd follow him around on the football field um, all the way up till, I don't know, uh, 10 years old, 11 years or whatever. Um, but I developed a competitive spirit. I developed, you know, strategizing, you know, um, persevering, right? Because, you know, the game isn't always going the way you want it to, but you got to fight through and try and still win. You know, a lot of that comes from my, my dad. And same thing with my mom as well, though. You know, my mom – the way she's raised me, the things that she's taught me, the way she, that positive um, words that she puts in me, you know, that, that stuff is, is very valuable that I do not take for granted. You know, the, when I, when I reflect deeply on this, right, we don't get to choose our parents. And so I'm very fortunate to end up with the parents that I did. And um, I think that's, you know, I'm just really grateful for that. And I think that's a great thing to, to celebrate is your, is your parents and to honor them. I, I, you know, it's so beautiful to hear you say that because many times we don't realize that we are learning. We are seeing, you know, when you talk about your father being a coach and you talk a lot in the book about the competitive spirit that you have and how you use that to become the person that you are. And I think that it's so beautiful that you're seeing the connection of learning that from your parents. I mean, I think that they must be extremely proud of you. You know, as difficult as it all is, I think that you are accomplished. You have already accomplished more than people accomplished in a longer, in a long life. You know, so many people don't get to do what you're doing, impacting so many people, writing a book. You told me about maybe movies and TV and whatever it is that you're working on. This is absolutely incredible. I mean, you have a nonprofit. Tell me about how you started this nonprofit. Tell us the kind of work that you're doing through it. I mean, you started when you were 15, right? Yeah, yeah. So the nonprofit mm -hmm. is called Destroy the Shin. And Destroy the Shin's mission is to complete the cure for shin muscular dystrophy by advancing gene editing and gene therapy into human practice. So the story of Destroy the Shin 
Uh, it all started when I was 15 years old. I was getting super interested in business and marketing and entrepreneurship. And I knew I wanted to do something great for the world, right? I kind of always knew that since I was like eight that, you know, I want to do something great for the world. Um, I was fascinated with architecture and maybe being an architect or just doing something that was, you know, great, right? I'm, a, I'm obsessed with greatness. Uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. But I knew when I was 15, I thought, well, why do I have to wait till I'm 25, 30 to do something great for the world? Why can't I be great now? I mean, why, you know, age is not a requirement to be great. So I thought, why? Let me just, just stop for a second. Why can't we be great now? I love this. Yes. Love this. <laughs> this is for all of us. Why can't we be great now? We can be great now. Continue. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's no, you know, age doesn't really matter when it comes to greatness. Uh, but anyways, so I didn't know what I wanted to do yet though. Right. But I wanted to do something. And then I went to a fundraiser. Okay. For Dishon Masa and I'm reading through this booklet before the presentation starts. It was, it was a dance uh, a high school dance team and they were going to dance and raise money or whatever. But anyways, I'm looking through this booklet at the end of the booklet. It talks about the shin. It says that's a muscle wasting disease. You know, that's not news to me. It says that patients end up in the, in a wheelchair. And I thought, okay, I'm in a wheelchair reading this booklet, not news. It said that patients will lose their um, mobility in their arms. And I thought, well, that, that right there is news to me. And I didn't like that because I'm someone that always threw the football around with my dad or my friends. I played catch with them. I shot baskets, uh, you know, basketball in my, in my wheelchair, I dribbled the ball in my wheelchair. I mean, I love being active, right? I'm a very, <laughs> I was a very active disabled person, if you will. Um, so that kind of shook me up, but then it got worse. Then it mentioned that most patients pass away when they're 25. And I just remember hyperventilating and being shocked right? Because, well, I'm 15 reading this 25. I mean, that's not, that's not too far. That wasn't, that wasn't too far from, from my age. And so I thought, well, that's news to me. I didn't know this disease kills people. And uh, to read that at such a young age, 15, you know, I mean, that's crazy. And I, and I'm looking at it and I thought, well, maybe they're wrong, but then it made me logically accept the reality because it said that it's a muscle wasting disease that attacks the heart and diaphragm. And I thought, well, those are muscles. If it's a muscle wasting disease, yeah, they would have to be a, they would have to be attacked too. So I thought, well, that's I guess that's it. But then the booklet it said that the disease is incurable. And whenever I hear somebody tell me that something's not possible or you can't do this or whatever, that I, I love that. That's you know you're going to say I can't do something. Well, let's see about it because I believe that I can. I believe I can do something about it. So I took that as a challenge. I thought, okay, let's see, let's see, let me get in the game. Let me see what I can do about it because I think that I can cure this. I think that I can change this. I had such a strong self-belief already. Anyways, I went home that day and I wanted to get my mind off of what I just read. So I, I put on my favorite superhero, uh, Iron Man. I love Iron Man. And I'm watching Tony Stark and, you know, he uses his knowledge to solve his problems and stuff. And I'm watching him and I'm thinking, you know, why couldn't I do the same thing? Why can't I use my business knowledge and that passion for entrepreneurship and do something about this disease? And it's all coming together now. I know how I could be great. I know what great thing I could do for the world. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do something about this. So should I start a for-profit or a non-profit? Well, I'm 15. You know, I don't have a lot of resources. I don't have a lot of money. You know, I don't know a lot of people. A non-profit probably makes the most sense for now. So I started a GoFundMe. I wanted to raise $600 to pay for the legal fees, you know, starting a non-profit. Now, to touch on the legal part, right, that's the whole story itself. In ninth grade, which is when I'm starting this, right. I was in mock trial. Mock trial is a, is a club at high school that you compete against other schools. And, uh, it's basically a, like a trial criminal trial where you act as a lawyer. And so I've made the pretrial motion and I had um, real attorneys that were my coaches that would teach me law and stuff like that. So I kind of had, uh, you know, I had connection to lawyers and stuff that could kind of guide me in the right direction or whatever. So anyways, I, I started to go fund me. We raised a thousand dollars and I only wanted to raise six hundred dollars, so we already ahead of um, had a schedule. And then I started recruiting board members. So you know, I'm a 15 year old calling these prominent people in my my community. Hey, do you want to you know be a part of something I'm starting? And it felt kind of weird and funny, but but I did it. And uh, they agreed to join the board of directors. So I got my board ready. You know, we started filing for the Articles of Incorporation with the state of California. We started filing for our uh, employee identification number. You know, we're dealing with the IRS now. We're getting tax exemption letters, all that stuff. It's all coming together. I create the social media accounts. I create the logo. I, you know, I, I know how to do Photoshop and stuff like that. I create that. 
I start coming up with a marketing plan. You know, I, I just love marketing and I've read so many books on it, watched so many great marketers with their presentations, their uh, lectures, all that. So I have some of this knowledge and, I, and I'm putting things together and I just start producing content and start just going at it. And uh, that's the beginning of the journey. And, and here we are today. Amazing. Uh, how much money have you managed to raise? Uh, I believe like the total amount, I, I don't know the, you know, I don't know the specifics, but I believe it's over a hundred K. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we haven't really focused so much on raising money, but more of the awareness part. But mm-hmm. now I'm trying to transition it into let's raise the money. So, you know, people want to donate, they can go to destroydition.org to donate. Um, but really my whole belief, right. Is that this disease needs a face behind it. Right. It doesn't have that. And and and, and I want to I want to touch on that, if you don't mind. I, I think that the, the reason why it doesn't have a face behind it, it's not because of how rare the disease is. There's there's rare diseases like this, like ALS, for example. But right. ALS is way more known by the general public than Duchenne is. Now, why is that? Well, if we look at ALS, there has been people uh, that, that they get it typically when they're 40 plus, 40 plus years old. OK. And they already have a huge platform or they already have a lot of connections or they're already super famous to where they could use that platform to raise tons of awareness towards their disease. Now, when you take the shin, you basically get it, you know, you start noticing it when you're about six and you pass away when you're 25. You know, in your early 20s, most people are just figuring out who they are. There's no time to build that huge platform and have a lot of people follow you, if you will, to where they care about it and, and want to do something about it. And so I think that I have a chance to change that. I really do believe that. I believe that I could be the face of this disease. And as far as I know, no one has done this yet. You know, nobody has. Nobody claimed with... that spot. <laughs> what, what did you say? Nobody has claimed that spot. And good for you for claiming it. I mean, nobody, yes. nobody has been going on a, a PR tour, or going on right. talk shows, podcasts, writing a book with, right. the, you know, with the disease. Um, to the to the degree I'm trying to do, you know, I, I want to make this worldwide known. I want not only do I want to make it known, though, right? I want to make it cared about. Um, one of my inspirations is Magic Johnson, right? Magic Johnson, he's one man, one man. I, I'm a huge basketball fan, by the way. <laughs> but one man, when he got HIV, he was able to use his huge platform, and he really changed the public's perception around HIV and did a lot of good uh, t- towards that, you know towards that cause. And I'm just inspired by that because, you know, the, it just takes one person to make a difference. And mm-hmm. I could be that one person for this disease. And I think that if we make it known and cared about, the money will follow, the science will will advance, and we'll save hundreds of thousands of lives across the world. I have no doubt. And I know that you're the right person for it. I can, I feel it when you're talking, I feel your passion. I have no doubt about it. I want to talk a little bit about your book. I want to start with the name because I thought that the whole story of how you named the book and how, how that happened. Right. And then it became the book. It was, it was so amazing because I so believe in, we just need a little spark. We just need a little hope right? To accomplish big things. So tell us about the story with your spine. Right. So a small if, right? The title of my book, where does it come from? Well, that's the first chapter. It's the story of my spine. So when I was 16 years old, my spine was starting to become curved, right? Scoliosis. And that's common with uh, people with my disease, the shin muscle dystrophy. What I, so I went to the doctors, we do the x-ray, I get off the x-ray table, you know, we're looking at the x-ray and the doctor says, you know, your spine is curved so much to the point to where I'm going to have to really push for you to have spinal surgery, right? They want to insert a metal rod in my back to straighten out my spine. I don't want that. He's really starting to push for it. He's going, you know, we'll do during the summertime to avoid the flu season, um, we will have this team of doctors to really get, he's getting specific with it. So I know he's serious. I look over to my left. My mom is crying. My doctor hands her a tissue. I look over, I see my dad, he's got his head down. That's what he does when he's sad. So I'm going, wow. Okay. And I'm sitting there smiling. I'm smiling, right? I would probably look crazy, but I'm smiling. Why am I smiling? Because I do not accept this news. I do not accept I'm going to have the surgery. It's not acceptable to me. And so I go back and forth with my doctor and I'm not really getting anywhere. Then I asked him, I said, okay, fine, fine. 
let's just say I decide not to have the surgery. What if I just tell you no, right? You can't make me have the surgery. He said, well, yeah, you can do that. But as your doctor, you know, I got to push for you to have the surgery. I got to put my foot down and say, you got to have the surgery. Okay, fine. So then I go, well, let's just say, let's just say if I'm somehow able to reverse the current state of my spine, could I then, could I then not have to have the surgery? And he looks at me and he says, look, I don't want to give you any false hope. I got to really put my foot down as your doctor and push for you to have the surgery. I've never seen anybody do this before. You know, it's basically medically impossible. But because I know you, I will give you a small if. That's if you're able to reverse it, you don't have to have the surgery. A small if. And I thought, okay, good. A small if. That's a possibility. That's all I need to hear is a possibility. From that day forward, I swore off eating tweets because I wanted to lose weight. I thought losing weight, that was going to do something that would that would maybe relieve some of the pressure off my spine, whatever. I taught myself how to cook because, like I said, I wanted to lose weight, eat healthier. So, you know, you'd see me in the kitchen driving the wheelchair in one hand, carrying the pan in the other hand, right? I was determined, right? So I did meal prepping and stuff like that, you know, cooking uh, chicken and rice and asparagus, broccoli, all this good stuff. Um, I worked out every single day at my house. Every single day. I went to physical therapy, which is a huge part of my success. I went to physical therapy. They did intense stretching. Sometimes it hurts so much when they're stretching me that I bite down on my shirt uh, to, to avoid, like, you know, basically yelling because it, it hurt. But, you know, I wanted my spine to be straight more than I cared about the pain. Right. I wanted to pull this off. A lot of my motivation for pulling this off wasn't just I don't want to have the surgery, but it was also the part of, you know, doing the impossible <laughs> doing what people said I can't do. And I love my doctor. I love my doctor. I still talk to him to this day. I still go to him. He's a great doctor. I've known him since I was a little kid. Um, but I wanted to prove him wrong, right? <laughs> and uh, and um, I did that. And then the other key part of my success is I, I, I put a picture of my spine, the curved spine, on my bedroom wall. So every morning I would wake up and I would look at it and it would set the 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 mentality I needed that day of what I need to focus on. And I would visualize myself making my spine straight. And I'd visualize how happy I feel, how great it would feel to pull this off. And um, I even visualized myself drinking an Oreo shake at my favorite um, place uh, at, in Newport. It's this Shake Shack. It's really cool. You can, it overlooks the ocean. It's awesome, right? And I visualized that because I thought that's how I'm going to celebrate this. So three months later, I go back to the doctor's. I'm very confident my spine is straight. Like I'm almost like hundred percent sure it's straight. I get off the x-ray table and I'm like fired up. And like, you know, you probably don't see that in a doctor's office of like basically an athlete mindset. Like, you know, I'm fired up. Like I'm playing a sport at this point. I go into the room. I look at my spine. I'm like, that's straighter. I'm looking at it. That's definitely straighter. Doctor comes in, he evaluates it. And he's like, that's straighter. You did it. It was done. Pulled it off. Small lift. That's all I needed. That same day, went to Newport, and I got that Oreo shake, and I celebrated just as I've been visualizing since day one. That's a this, small work right there. This is this is so incredible. It's so exciting. It's so amazing. And I I, I am with you 100%. You know, um, the people that follow me, they, they know my story, my husband's story. My husband had two strokes, and then we found out he had a tumor. But part of what this tumor caused uh, was diabetes. And when we found out about the tumor, we, we were going into surgery and we asked, you know, can the diabetes be gone once we remove this tumor? And the doctors all said, mm, no, the, the diabetes is not, maybe the blood pressure is going to go down, less chances of stroke, but the diabetes is not going away. The doctor walks out of the room and I look at my husband and I said to him, I refuse to accept what he said as true and can we make a pact that you are with me on this one that we will not accept this as the truth and he said 100 percent. i also believe that diabetes is going to be gone my husband had the surgery and then three months later we do it in a1c and the diabetes was gone and his sugar is is normal and i think that it's this belief when we believe in something that belief itself is part of the medicine. That visualization itself starts working. Our body, our cells start modifying themselves based on what we see. 
So that's why visualization is so important for goals in business, for health, if you want to meet the person that you want to marry, whatever it is, whatever goal you have in life, to see it and believe it. And what you said about the celebration is so true. I always tell my kids, see yourself celebrating getting exactly what you want to do. Like, what is it that you're going to do? Who are you going to invite for this party if you do what you want to do? You know, when you accomplish what you want to accomplish, let's plan the party because that puts you in a whole mood. It changes who you are, your, your energy, and it brings you closer to, to what you want. This is an amazing story. Right. I, I would add to that, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is the placebo effect, right? That's, that's yeah. my proof. When you believe your beliefs are powerful. That's why the placebo is tested when we take medicines. You know, we have to make sure it's not just somebody's beliefs causing the desired outcome. That's crazy to me. That right there is proof that your beliefs matter. I mean, literally we have tests where, you know, someone will have knee pain and they'll just put basically water on it, but they'll say, oh, this is the medicine. And then they put it on it and they go, and the, and the patient actually believes, oh yeah, this medicine is going to make me feel better. And it's just water. And then their knee, they have no pain anymore. Exactly. That is the power of your beliefs. Exactly. No, it's, it's so powerful. But it's interesting because even though we know it, a lot, we talk about it. A lot of people talk about it. Joe Dispenza talks about it. So many people that have a tremendous amount of influence, right? They talk about it. Why people still don't believe it and don't try. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't take away much of the time because when you think about it, you could do it in three times a day, five minutes each time. This is not super time consuming. Why are still people not believing and not trying? Do, do, do you have you spoken to people that are not implementing this? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people that don't want to try. Um, I never asked myself why. Um, why don't they want to try? I think, you know, I don't know. I, I question why people do a lot of the things they do or don't do. You know, it's like if it's free and you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. I mean, you just go try it. If it doesn't work for you, fine good now you learn now you can literally cross it off your your list but like what if it does work for you it's right? a, that, that is ex this is something that i've spoken about before because i always i i go to doctors and i believe in regular medicine but i also go to alternative i go to chiropractors i go to acupuncture i've gone to salt uh caves you know i mm -hmm. i research for things that are also in the alternative realm. And I always say to people, it doesn't hurt. Why not try? Like, I, I, I wish people were more open uh, to believe, especially people like you, that you're showing this is, uh, this, there's no questions. This is, this is what it was. This is what I did. And this is how in three months it got to transform. I yeah. think, I think, um, I hope, I hope that people, a lot of people will listen to this and will give a chance to this type of work, to this type of um, uh, energy and belief and visualization and change their lives for the better, just like you did. So tell me a little bit about everything that you are doing. You shared with me that you are writing, that tell me, t tell me what are your plans? Like, where do you go from here with your story? Right. So, you know, I'm going to continue doing a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts, a lot of things like that, putting out more content that can help people. Right. All my my whole life's cause is to minimize human suffering and propel human prosperity so that humanity can have a better quality of life. You know, I'm really big on minimizing human suffering. So anything that I can do to do that. So, you know, maybe writing more books, writing more content, making more videos, making more doing more interviews, more TV shows, more podcasts, stuff like that, that accomplishes a deeper, you know, impact. Uh, not just doing it to do it, but doing it for impact, right? That's that's what I hope to do. You know, I'm also running my organization, trying to raise more money to cure this disease. I give uh, public speeches, things like that. Um, th there's a lot of things that I that I do to accomplish, like I said, my ultimate goal to minimize human suffering. So any different method I could do to to do that, I, I will, and and that's really what I do every single day. Fantastic. What about connecting you with some sports players to use their um, influence 
and speak about the shame because you were you, your point about the comparison between ALS and the shame and how it became famous because of the age of the people and the influence that they have. I thought it was brilliant, you know, how I was going to say that it was the ice bucket challenge that made it ALS so famous. I mean, I think that that was the first time that I heard about ALS was through the ice bucket because everybody's throwing and I'm like, why is everybody throwing ice buckets on their head? And I went to, and I did some research, but it's interesting how something, a campaign like that can really bring visibility to, to, to a disease. And I don't know, but maybe we can try to look for people who have a huge influence and they allow them to maybe have you as a as a guest, or maybe they want to take on the to be the voice also to assist you. Obviously, they don't have the experience, but they have the platform. They can bring you to their platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. My my, you know, my creative wheels are spinning to see who do I know and how can we make a connection, because you know, being that. My life has been touched by the shame too. Um, it's personal, right? We we know somebody, and we, and I now I know you on top of the other people that I that I know. Um, I have to to put some thought into that and see. I think that we need to support each other in finding the ways to spread messages that are so important. Yeah, I mean, if you know anybody in particular that you think that would be a good connection, you know, send them my way. I would love to work with whoever wants to help this important and urgent cause. Yeah, I, I have an idea of somebody. So I am going to reach out. Um, I'm going to reach out soon and I'm going to share this video with them and maybe they can make some kind of an introduction. I, I will definitely do my best because I'm inspired by you. I, I'm inspired by your tenacity, by your grit, uh, but more than anything, by, by your zest of life, you know? Um, my father passed away two years ago, but he always used to say that I, between the girls, we, I'm one of three girls, my father always used to say that I was the one with joie de vivre, in French is, you know, with joy of life. Uh, today is, is interesting because you're talking about business and I was, you know, looking at what I'm doing in my life with my business, it has changed and evolved so much. I started with marketing. I did marketing for 25 years and then I, I changed a little bit. But when I was looking at my title, now I do, I do fashion design and I'm thinking mm, I'm not a fashion designer. And I said, you know what I am? I'm a joy alchemist. That's what I am, you know, and that's what I want to do. I want to bring joy in, in, into the world. And I want to be that girl with the joie de vivre. And when I see you and I talk to you, I feel that. And it's almost like, oh, now I know what my father was talking about, that he could see that joy in me. I see it in you. Um, and it's inspiring. And it's, uh, and it's coming from somebody who has gone through so many hard things in life. It's even more inspiring. And I, I really hope that people talk about, this is what I want to talk about, about the comparison. You, you wrote here in your book, and, and by the way, is the book available on Amazon? Yes, yes it is. What, what, what other places can people buy your book? Uh, anywhere online, Target, Barnes and Nobles, um, you name it, it's, it's there. Okay, guys, this is a book that you have to, I love the way the book was split uh, between the story and then there is um, a, a, a method that, um, that Elijah applies in his life to help him. And uh, for example, here, consistency is key. So he's talking about consistency. Uh, uh, what, but what was the one that I wanted you to talk about? Oh, the comparison. I love that. I think it was when you talked about gratitude, living with gratitude. Is that chapter 10? Chapter 10. Yeah. Yes. And I love that because it's so true. We realize and we become grateful when we realize when we don't have something that we had before. When we have it, we take for granted. So talk about that example about the phone. You, do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So lesson 10, uh, there's these different lessons at the end of each chapter. So lesson 10 of, of the lesson gratitude, it teaches this powerful psychological method of contrasting, right? When we contrast two different things, 
we can see the difference between it. So, like, for example, if you have a straight line, um, you know, you could then see a crooked line more crooked than if it, there was nothing to compare it to. And so the, the, the cell phone one that you're talking about is I, I said, like, take your cell phone, for example. You may not you may take it for granted, but go a whole day without it. Like, go put it in a drawer somewhere, you know, and don't use it at all. You're not allowed to use your phone. I guarantee you, you'll be more grateful than you are today for your cell phone, for something like that. You know, for me, for example, someone might say, well, you have a terrible situation. You're in a wheelchair, whatever. I'm grateful that I have a wheelchair. Let's start there because some people do not have a wheelchair or their wheelchair broke or this or that. At least I have a functioning wheelchair today. That is something that I could be grateful for. Now, the, the key to this lesson, though, is a lot of people say, oh, be grateful, whatever, right? And, and, and it's good advice, but they don't really mean it. It's like, yeah, I'm grateful for my parents. Yeah, I'm grateful for this. That's not powerful enough. That's not powerful enough. You don't really mean it. To really mean it, contrast. Now, this, this is not morbid, but imagine and, and really close your eyes and visualize and, and feel all the different senses. What would it be like to, to not have somebody in your life that you care about, Right. And then when you realize that, then you'll be way more grateful for them. And then maybe after you go through this exercise, maybe you call them and tell them, I love you. I care about you. I just wanted you to know that today. I hope you have a good day. Maybe it's a text message, whatever. That right there is the power of gratitude. When you really, really are truly appreciative of someone or something. And you can do that by the power of contrasting between um, having and not having. I have to tell you that I do that all the time. And it's so true that it's so powerful. And when you said about the imagine not having that person, now you are so happy you have them call them, right? I, I do that. But what I realize is that I shouldn't be annoyed by certain things that I get annoyed that people do. When you think, what if I didn't have this person? And then you say, okay, so I have this person. So this thing that annoys me that they did, I'm, I shouldn't be so angry about because I'm so grateful that I have this person. So isn't it true? So many people now with COVID, they lost so many lo loved ones. They would do everything to have that person back. It doesn't matter if the laundry is on the floor, if they didn't help with the shopping, if they didn't fill the car with gas, right? All the little things that are noises by the people that are in our surroundings, right? But they, they, don't, they don't do those things. It's nothing if, you know, in the, the comparison. So now you're grateful for those little things. I do that often in my life and it has helped me so much. And I think it's, I'll tell you one thing that I do. And you also mentioned to write three things. I write 10 things that I'm grateful for. Uh, some people do it before they go to sleep. They do, I do it when I wake up, but a lot of people do it before they go to sleep because they want to put good thoughts in their mind before they fall asleep. I do it mentally when I go to sleep. But what's interesting is that I have a rule. I am not allowed to write the big things. I'm not allowed to write, I'm thankful for my life or I'm thankful for my, I'm not allowed to. And the reason that I put this, this rule was because I have to look all day for things to write the next day. It's 10 things to write, a lot of things. So you, but, and I'm not allowed to write for my vision, for my health, like all the big things I'm not allowed to write. So I have to look for, oh, a, a, a child of mine made me a cup of tea. The cup of tea is so delicious. They, they brought it to me. Okay, I, I'll write that. You know, the water was so fresh and tasty, you know. But I'm all day long looking for the little things in my life because the yeah. next day I have to put it in writing. So there's this book. I believe it's called The Happiness Advantage. And I believe it's written by Sean Anker. Maybe I'm wrong on the name. But um, this book, it's all about the science of happiness. How can we be happy? And mm -hmm. one of the keys is actually to write 10 things you're grateful for every every day and to really focus on them, the small things. And, and the reason why is it's, well, one, being grateful is a good thing. But what this does is it trains your brain to start to look for positivity and yeah. things. And that's how you become more happy. So you're literally training your brain by doing this exercise yeah. to look for the positive in life. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing for sure. Yeah. And I was just talking about this with one of my coaching clients. And it was very interesting because I asked her and I said, who do you want to give to? Who do you want to, to, to give things? to people that show gratitude to you, right? You don't want to give to ungrateful people in your life. So I believe in God and I believe that if I'm a grateful person, 
God's going to want to shower me with more blessings because I'm a grateful person. Gratitude attracts more, more things to be grateful for. So there you go, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I, uh, I definitely think God wants us to be grateful for what he gives us for sure. Tell me one, uh, one or two other points in your book that you would like to share. Uh, well, I think that one of the major life lessons that would be really helpful to people, I tell them this, tell people this all the time, is the dichotomy of control. Lesson nine. This lesson says, it comes from ancient Stoicism, ancient philosophy. It says to focus on what we can control and disregard what we cannot control. The, the key to this lesson is a majority of things are not in your control. And you need to realize that. Now, you, th there's a difference between controlling something and being able to influence it. For example, there may be a person that I want to be friends with. Okay, I can't control if they want to be friends with me ever. Control, let's, let's define it though. Control is the desiring or controlling the or determining the outcome. Right. I can make them be my friend. I cannot make them be my friend. Now I can influence them to be my friend. I can be nice to them, listen to them, take an interest in them. But that's just influence. So ultimately, it's not in my control. So I just disregard it. So if they don't want to be my friend, okay, it's whatever. You just move on because I know that's not in my control and I have to let that go. It's such an important concept because the things that we cannot control are usually the things that take control over our mind. We become obsessed with those things, right? It starts by us wanting to control and then worrying what happens if we don't manage to control. And then that stress grows, becomes anxiety. And all we're dealing with is something that is completely out of our control. I have done so much work in this area of control. I always say that I've never in my life gotten drunk and it's not because I'm not foolish. It's because I am so scared of losing control. <laughs> you know, I have this and I started doing things specifically for me to see, to let go, to let go a little bit of this control. So uh, last year I allowed myself to be hypnotized um, I went to a breath workshop. All of the things that I didn't want to do because I wouldn't, I didn't know how I would control myself. It starts with us letting go of that control of ourselves and things. So I, um, it's a, I'm a work in progress. I, this is a hard one, right? Not to want to control things, not to be worried about the things that we cannot control. That's a big one. Tell me an example of how you do it in your life, in your personal life, when you started losing, when you needed a wheelchair. Like, wh at what point did you accept your situation and not become too focused on controlling the situation? Honestly, uh, I don't really, like, for me, it's really weird. Like, I've never really been one that's like, Oh, I, I just hate being in a wheelchair or whatever. Like, I mean, being in a wheelchair has its challenges and stuff, but I never was the one that was like, I can't accept this, can't accept this. And then eventually accepted it. I kind of accepted it since, since it happened, since I went into a wheelchair. But I, I think some of the lessons, like to apply this lesson to my life, like some of the ways I use it is really with people's judgment. And that would kind of relate back to going in the wheelchair is I had to learn, like people are going to look at me, you know, this thing's, this wheelchair is an attention magnet, you know, it's going to draw attention to me. Um, I can't control that. But what I did realize is I can control what I do without attention. So I could be a good person. I could be a, a role model for people. I could direct people towards positivity. I could use this mini magnet platform, whatever you want to call it, to direct people to whatever I want them to have their attention on. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I took the situation. But when it comes to people's judgments, you know, everyone's scared of people. Well, what are they going to say? Whatever. I honestly don't even care at this point what people say. Um, if it's going to be negative or, or even positive for that matter, like, you know, I, I want to just focus on what I can't control because I can't control if someone says, I hate you, or I love you. It's both out of my control. I could just focus on my attitude towards whatever they say. Amazing. Let's see. We are getting some comments here. 
Love the concept of looking for the 10 things throughout the day to be grateful for. It's amazing. It's so helpful. I also do it when I get a little bit anxious before bed. Lately, I am getting because I am going through a lot of stress. Uh, I start saying, okay, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for that. And then I suddenly fall asleep. Mm. You know, I, I always say, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, too much positivity. Okay, we heard it. Go to sleep. I don't know. But um, same here about getting a drink. Thanks. So. How's they're experimenting with drugs? Um, so hard. Yeah. I was always in control of everything. But after my stroke, I had a lot um, to, go, to let go of control. Oh, I know about letting go of controls after stroke. Yes. Um, we should all start a gratitude short journal for 2022. Marina, spearhead it. Everybody, let's buy a journal. And we can even meet up in the group and say, uh, share a few of the things that we're grateful for. So we can give people idea what to look for during the day. I'm happy to do that. Uh, start using the vision came seven vision loss. I use this for opportunity to encourage people to help me. Oh, by the way, this is, I don't know who, who is this person. You, did, you didn't approve StreamYard, so I don't know your name, but it's very interesting what you're saying is I had a very hard time accepting, and I think I, I spoke about that in the last show, that I, was, I had a hard time accepting help. And I don't know how you feel about that, Elijah, but accepting help to me, was difficult in the beginning. I prefer to be on the giving side until I had to stop and say, why do I feel this way about receiving help? And I, I was scared that it was coming from an ego, that it was coming from a place where I thought I was above. So I was the one that had to give, but not to receive. And I was so scared. I said, oh my God, that cannot be me. If that's me, that's awful. I That would be horrible. So I started allowing to, to receive. I started accepting help from people. And what I noticed was that when you allow to receive, you're also giving exactly as Ophira, I see that, it, that, that it's you, that when you allow for somebody else to help you, you are giving them an opportunity to do a good deed. And doing good deeds is the most incredible joy producing thing that we can do when we help another person we feel so good we feel so joyful so if we allow to receive what we're doing is we're giving somebody else this opportunity to to to, to also feel so so joy so it was a, a real opportunity for me to understand that being on the receiving end is as amazing as being on the giving end and, you know, I think that you know that, Elijah. I mean, you, you depend on people to do certain things and you're giving them an opportunity to help you. And you're helping other people. You're helping the world. You're helping all the other patients with Duchenne, all the other people who suffer from this disease, but not only them, for their families. You're helping the pa when other parents see what you're doing, you're giving them hope. Yeah, no, that's actually... Part of my lesson in the adapter's mindset, that lesson there, I talk about, you know, how you have to develop an adapter's mindset and that just allows you to be more creative. So it's like, I'm going to adapt to the situation no matter what. And one of the ways that you can adapt though, is to swallow your pride, you know, push the ego to a side and ask for help. Sometimes that's the best way to adapt. Yes. Yeah. I want to hear your last thought, a parting thought, something that you want to share with the community, with the people who are here and the people who are going to hear later on. What is one message that you want to leave here tonight? I think something that I would tell people, this is really personal, so I'll just say this, but I think that, you know, considering that I have a fatal disease and thinking about death and how serious life is, I would say that, um, you know, I'm someone that's really philosophical someone that's really spiritual, I'd say, you know, think about God and think about what life's really about. Like what, it, what, what are you going to say to God when you, when you die? You know, did you use your life? Did you use your time wisely, correctly? Um, what's your relationship like with God? Um, you know, I, I believe in God really strongly. And I believe that, um, you know, 
when it's all said and done, nothing really matters but our relationship with God and what we did for God. And so, you know, I try to use my days um, to the best of my ability for how God created me, whether that's sharing positivity, telling people about God, um, trying to encourage people, whatever it is. So I would just think about that because I think that even if you don't have a fatal disease or anything like that, you still want to spend your time as best as you can today and, and for the days that you have left on this earth. That couldn't be a better message. Uh, it's a message that applies to everybody. I live my life this way too. So we have a lot in common. Um, my promise to you is that with the little bit of contacts that I have, I'm going to make a few phone calls to see if we could connect you. I don't know the influential people directly, but I know people who do. So I'm going to do my part to see how we can spread your message. You are a powerhouse. I have no doubt that you're going to accomplish a tremendous amount. You are already, you have already changed the world for the better. And you, and I know you will just continue doing so. I want to thank you for, for your time, for sharing your story, for the book, and uh, for all the amazing work that you're doing. You are a hero. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all that. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming. I ask you, please uh, share this video with everybody you know. Um, those videos, those interviews, this, this is free. This is a, this is not for me. This is for everybody else. This is, I'm just, a, I'm just a conduit. I'm just a messenger to bring these amazing people, uh, that God put me in, on, in my path to share their messages so they can influence somebody for the good. So please take these videos, share them on your pages, bring people here so more people can uh, be inspired uh, by the true heroes that I'm lucky to interview. Um, Elijah, keep going. I can't wait for our next conversation. Everybody, have a good night.